Um, the recording for last week's session is up and available on the ULVLC LibGuide. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to put those in the chat. And for our presenters, I will keep an eye on the chat and see uh, what comes up so that you don't have to do that yourself. And with that, I will turn it over to whoever is uh, moderating me. today. Well, me and then we're turning it over to Nakia, who's going to moderate. So thank you all for coming. Um, I think most of you, yeah, we're here for the uh, description of kind of what our group has done and what we are planning on doing in the future. But just as a quick recap, um, this semester we've been focused on um, looking across the library at different um, community connections, community-based projects, and we're um, things that are that are connecting the library with the community outside of our campus. Um, so we sent out a survey. Thank you to everybody who responded. We did a session last week that was focused on starting community connections that um, starred Nakia, who will be our uh, moderator today, um, and uh, me and Stacy Cram. Uh, uh, like Jenny said, that recording is up. I do want to go ahead and give you a heads up that we do have a third session that's um, coming up after the break um, on uh, January 7th at 1 o'clock. So that's going to be the third and final Community Connections panel. It's going to be focused on resources that people have relied on for um, building and growing these types of projects. Um, and it's going to be featuring uh, David, Kathleen, and Jessica Dame, who I will say I know that many of you don't know who Jessica, because Jessica is a temp SP SHRA who works in special collections. Um, who was on this call, I see your name, but um, Jessica had the joy of starting work in the libraries the week we closed the library building in March. So um, I'm looking forward to everybody getting to, to hear from, from her too. But anyways, so with that said, I'm gonna turn things over to Nakia, who's gonna be um, moderating our chat. We're gonna go with the same format that we went with um, for the previous session. And um, as Jenny said, Feel free to type any questions in the chat, but we are going to be leaving a pretty substantial chunk of time at the end for, for Q&A. So thank you all for coming and take it away, Nakia. Thank you, Erin. All right, so again, for our presenters, um, the format that we did it for last time, in case you were not here, is alphabetical order by last name. So that'll be the order that you answer each question, right? So that puts Richard, Gerald, and then Beth Ann. Um, with that being said, um, you have about three minutes to answer the question. Um, there is some leeway I'll give you to go over it, but again, we wanna leave enough time at the end so people can do a Q and A. So I'll give you some type of uh, signal that should be um, low key. If not, you know, I'll just play on my arm. But you guys got it, all right? So the first question is, can you talk about a community-based project that you've started with the local community or community group for the libraries? And this can be a program, an event, projects, et cetera. Richard? Sure. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about um, the most recent component of the Digital Library in American Slavery, which is People Not Property. Um, the short version of that project is we've been looking at collecting deeds from across over 20 counties in North Carolina that mention in some way enslaved people um, and bring that all together as a part of DLAS. Um, it was a National Archives funded grant that ends this coming October, so just luck in the home stretch. Um, it's run, and I can go into more detail about this later, but it's run via a community group that I brought together over five years ago, starting with Marcellus Joyner at the Heritage Research Center in High Point. Uh, and working with him, we identified a broad community of people who would be interested in working on DLAS, which would include people from African American Historical and Geological Society, public and academic historians, archivists, a few elected officials, and others to basically come together and decide what would be the topic of this at the time theoretical expansion of DLAS, which turned out to be uh, the People Not Property Project. Um, we also just kicked out a grant application, which is luck, Monday that will be um, purposefully will be PI'd from three other um, universities in the state, and they will be using DLAS with us as just the back end and an advisory role while they work in their local communities around the state doing using what we've done so far as something that they're now building upon. 
Thank you, Richard. Gerald, again, can you talk about a community-based project that you've started? Okay. Basically, this is a community read that I'm actually working with, well, Dr. Green and Afro-American and African Diaspora Studies on this campus is the main PI for this grant. And this is the NEA Big Read Grant, National Endowment for the Arts. And so basically working with the Greensboro Public Library and the Middle College at Bennett, we're gonna have this community read and our book is Silver Sparrow Tahari Jones. So basically I'm getting ready for a kind of a read se session where we're gonna discuss this book in February 9th. But basically $15,000, we had an opportunity to give out this book and have different discussions doing um, a, few to, a few during the fall semester and in the spring semester. Okay. Um, in terms of one I've started, it pretty much uh, the Women in Military Lecture Series, uh, but we've only had one of those because then we got COVID canceled this year. So I, I, it's more uh, perhaps more interesting and uh, more relevant to talk about the Women Veterans Luncheon, which predated me and in fact predated the actual Women Veterans Historical Project. So 1997, Betty Carter, who um, was the university archivist at the time, uh, put together a, um, an exhibit of Navy Waves uh, material and then had a luncheon to honor uh, women veterans. So it started very small and has expanded to the sort of flagship event um, for publicity and uh, networking and fundraising for the Women Veterans Project. So it happens every November. And uh, this year was the first virtual one, but um, it's, it's waxed and waned and has many, many stories to it, but I'll uh, we'll see if that comes up. All right, so we have People Not Property, the NEH Big Read, and then the Women Veterans Historical Project. So for each of you, after the initial start, um, how do you or how have you kept um, building this community-focused project? Sure. Um, if I were to like just narrow it down to a theme, it very much for the type of work I do it comes down to reciprocity with the local community and an open community an open conversation back and forth with community members, however you're defining community, um, and the importance of working together to try to find mutual goals and mutual priorities. So for example, like I said before, I created a, a steering committee to talk about, and we come together. I didn't say, I, my point in bringing the community together was like, you all in your different areas and your different communities that tie in with this project, larger DLAS and the interest in DLAS, what do you think are areas we should look look at moving into, I suppose is a way to put it, to expand the, the existing project? And they told me it was deeds of enslavement. And so based upon the feedback from all these different groups who are all invested in the project, we moved forward and did working on deeds of enslavement. Um, it's also important to take feedback because this is a, we're talking about a mutual level playing field sort of um, relationship you're going to have feedback you need to take it honestly and openly and understand in these situations you're not going to be the expert most of the time definitely not all the time uh, there will be people who will be bringing more things to the relationship than you and that's that's good if it's more than two people um and i think you know it's also important once you start building these relationships, start working with people to look at more community initiated projects. You know, it's, it's not your project. It's not your work. It's, it's our work. It's their work. So just as some quick examples, I've been working with someone from the African American Historical and Geological Society to try to figure out if we can do something with, without getting tech dork on you. I'm working on 
graph databases and can we use something like a graph database on the information we already have to start building social networks of people who are in the LAS and what do you get out the other end and that sort of thing happens. Um, um, there's also, you know, with the Well-Crafted Project, you know, those four, the Four Saints Brewery and Ashboro actually came to us to work with them on doing some planning to like record some video interviews for their fourth anniversary. And another project I've worked a good bit with Guilford Dilf County and they came to me with questions. So really, it's really important to always work to try to work with the community. And if they're bringing projects to you, you try to work and as hard or harder on the ideas they bring as the ones you bring to it, because then you'll get a fuller project. You'll have something that more people are invested in. And honestly, with a broader coalition, you'll have a better chance of getting the project done and getting people to trust you, which is building the trust can be a long process, but it's an important one. And it's very, it's a very rewarding process as well. Well put, Gerald. Okay. Um, probably one of the main reasons why I'm a part of this project is because when we were thinking about applying for this grant, and of course this was way before we were thinking about pandemic, um, we were thinking about bringing groups together and primarily, um, you know, having this community read, but also thinking about ways that we can discuss the book as well as talk about some of the needs and some of the things that are going on in the community. Two of the, two of the main reasons that we put in our proposal, we wanted to use the novel to discuss the challenges of black girls in particular and all of those who identify as girls in Greensboro and support, providing support. We also wanted to use the novel to discuss challenges that parents face and identify as means of support for parents. Um, February 9th is actually going to be kind of like a father's night. And um, I'm actually inviting members of my fraternity to actually be on the panel, in addition to call in and be a part of this, the virtual discussion. We also have a faculty member from the social work department that's going to help us to talk about supporting and, and, and so forth, too. Um, but like I said, I think we're, we're looking for opportunities to help the community. Of course, I mentioned Greensboro Public Library. I've mentioned Middle College there at Bennett. Of course, being virtual, there will be others who are will know about this and will have an opportunity to kind of come in and join us. So we're, we're, we're excited about it. It'll be my first time actually doing um, this type of a, a discussion and coordinating it. So. I'm a little nervous, but definitely I'm looking forward to it and I'm glad I have some time to prepare. Okay, the uh, luncheon has taken, um, in terms of, of um, building it, is definitely a long and winding road. Um, and I just keep trying different things. When I first, the first one I did uh, when I got here in fall, uh, what well, got here in February 2008. So November 2008, I just was um, continuing what had been done. Uh, it was held in the EUC. And it was primarily, there was a mostly World War II veterans. Um, so I just kind of did what that was. It was free. Um, it had been free. Betty had paid for it out of an unrestricted fund that um so for the first few years i was able to do that then the world war ii vets um stopped either they either passed away or they were not able to drive anymore so the numbers quickly went down um so i just tried to um I, you know just send things out in the mailing list uh, our mailing list we add to it every year um there's about a thousand usually i just send invitations to you know, local people and uh, donors. Like we have a donor who lives in Colorado. I don't think she's gonna come, but um, you know, she sh should get an invitation. So I get the, um, you know, the UNCG to send out a press release. Uh, so we, you know, occasionally we'll have local community members 
um, it was tricky after the the unrestricted funding was cut off because then it had to pay for itself. And so there were a few um, hard years because catering costs go up every single year. And um, so the numbers really went down when people had to pay for lunch because it's a lot more expensive that I'd be willing to pay for lunch. So there were just a few hardcore people. Um, I made it so that student veterans who I'm always trying to um, get involved and you know other UNCG students would come for free. Um, the issue was it was on Saturday for you know the first 20 some years. And the, the issue with something being free, you know, people who do events know that you or you know, it's good to charge something because people tend to not come to free things. Also, a lot of our students, um, especially the veterans who are non-traditional students, they have families and um, children and second jobs, third jobs. So getting them involved was tricky. So that was an issue for the last three years. We had an alumni and um, the UNCG nursing school alumni and uh, women veteran who pretty much sponsored it. So we moved it to the much swankier alumni house, um, which was also a smaller venue. So now it's suddenly, um, you know, uh, a limited, you know, hotter ticket because, you know, there is a cutoff date. And many times I freaked out John Comer at the alumni house by, you know, um, coming really close to breaking fire code rules. Uh, so, you know, I've tried just a number of things, getting UNCG students involved, having the Spartans sing once and sing Roxanne to um, the participants, which was, was interesting. Uh, one year I had got the drama, um, drama school, the drama program students involved, playwriting, um, which I would do very differently because it didn't go well, but pulled off at the last second, <clears throat> lost 10 years of my life on that one. Um, you know, so I would have UNCG students reading, doing dramatic readings of oral history transcripts. And um, so that was good. We have a uh, nursing school. Um, there's a lot of um, veterans, they, they tend to, to be involved. Um, and at this point, it's almost kind of word of mouth. Um, you know, veterans tell other veterans. Um, you know, I have government people now, you know, thinking, ooh, we should come. One year we had Howard Colville come. One year we had representatives for the US senators get involved. Um, so I just sort of kind of throw it around. So the fact right now that it is, it has been free, um, it's going to be different if the sponsorship gets pulled because I'm not sure who's going to pay, you know, 25 bucks for a ticket. So actually with Nakia's help and Sean's help and Kathleen's help, um, going against my nature, um, asking people for anything, especially money is very difficult for me, but um, you know, kind of trying to get corporate sponsorship and we have table sponsorships. And the last thing since this year was um, virtual, so we didn't have to pay for lunch. Um, the fact that, you know, some of the women who have historically sponsored a table, which is essentially you pay the, um, you pay amount that would cover tickets for the table, plus some, you know, extra money for a donation and you can put whoever you want at the table, uh, either friends or a lot of people will be like, yeah, you know, just, just get students. Everyone wants student veterans to come. But this year, we, I still asked for table sponsorship, um, and you know, our historic donors have stepped up. So, you know, they're still a hardcore group. A lot of them are alumni, along with being veterans. Uh, I could go on, ramble, but I think, how do you keep building? So I just try everything. Yeah, but in that answer is good because it's a good segue to our next question is what issues, right? Did you encounter along the way in, in growing your project and what did you do to mitigate them? So Bethann, you 
stated some of the issues, right? Of course, like resources and fundings and things you've done to do around it. So I'm gonna go back to Richard and Gerald to answer that. And then Beth Ann, definitely feel free to answer um, some more. But what issues have you encountered and um, to mitigate them, Richard? Oh, um, uh, wow, a lot depending on, or a lot or a few depending on, you know, the angle you look at the work. So speaking about people not property um, for the most part within the communities I work with it's been very cooperative and we really haven't had any um, major issues we all know where we want to get at the end and we work to get there that said even though this is DLAS and people not property specifically is a it's a documentation project it's not interpretive research it's very much this is what this is do with it as you will there is and I'm lucky I understood this early on, there is absolutely a political aspect to this work. So there are, for example, four different elected officials that I work with pretty regularly on this. Um, you know, whenever they're up for re-election, they have certain concerns. Um, there have been a couple of elected officials who have told me to my face they will not work with me for one reason or another. Um, and just recently, there was one elected official who, um, yeah, there's an elected official who in um, one county actually ran this time. She, she just won election. And the fact that her predecessor would not work with me was a major part of her platform to get herself elected. Um, I thought she was joking, so I did some research. And sure enough, she actually absolutely was. Um, did in her platform and her speeches talk about how this person refused to work on our project as a part of her election campaign. So there is absolutely a political aspect to this work and I'll wager there is with a lot of community work. You just may not be aware of it at the outset. Um, that's just a very overt way. Um, but you do run into some things, you know, priorities may differ and people use different language. Um, you should even not even talk about the community and even the libraries, you talk to someone like me and you say the word archive is going to mean something very different than if you talk to Aaron or Beth Ann. Um, Google archives your emails. When I say that, I'm sure shivers run up their spines because it's you know, not the case in the same way. So you do have a lot of you know different priorities. The priorities of a historian who's trying to do their interpretive research for tenure is going to have a different priority from a genealogist who's trying to find their family. That's not that one is better or one is worse. It's just different priorities. And you thread that needle. Um, the best the best way you can and hope that you can get there 98 percent of the time because you can't do everything um especially when you start talking about multiple communities that are working on projects um and it, I, it also goes back to my you have to remember in doing this work you're not the expert uh, there are going to be people who are going to bring skills and talents and knowledge and perspectives that you just aren't going to have um just to Tag into what Beth Ann said, resources and budgeting is a major issue. I mean, um, none of the, the, you know, I talk about what craft did, I talk about people not property DLAS, and I do a lot of work with Guilford County government as well as a part of the NCU's Metro Lab. None of that's actually my job, um, in quotes, even though it certainly is. I mean, without funding, none of that work would get done. Without, you know, Tim telling me it is a part of my job and it's important. And with that, UNCG's communications team, like they are the number one rooters for all of my work. Um, it wouldn't get done. People not property for all the work it is. And it's a $300,000 National Archives grant. It's less, it's like 20 some counties out of 100 in North Carolina. And we found close to 20,000 records so far. I mean, how do you get the money to do the other 75% of your work? Um, $300,000 to do a sliver. Um, you know, the well-crafted project is no, it's very hands-on. And we've been asked for that one by not only the beer industry, of course, but we've been asked by like the wine industry and distillers and the kombucha, why aren't you doing us? Cider, why aren't you working with us? I mean, well, there's three of us. It's not our full-time job. And there's only 40 hours in a week. So, you know, resources and budgeting is, is a major thing um, that hinders 
hinders is a good word, honestly, hinders a lot of truly hands-on reciprative, reciprative yeah, um, work in your community, whatever your community is, because it is, it's very time consuming. Uh, you get very, if, if you're doing it well, I think you get very embedded in what people are doing and, and um, it takes a lot of work and it, it's good work, but it is work. So. Right. Thank you, Richard. Gerald, you want to talk about some of the um, issues you've encountered and what you've done to mitigate, solve them? Well, uh, you know, initially we were planning and when we did our proposal, everything was going to be in person and live. So of course, when things started changing, we saw thought, okay, we're not gonna get the money. They're probably not gonna do this this year because of this. That's when they offered us the money and said, hey, we like it, let's move forward. So of course, everything has had to change. And I, I know for me, I was really looking forward to presenting over at Middle College at Bennett and down at Greensboro Public Library, you know, live actual moderated sessions. But since that's not gonna happen, of course, the technology has been wonderful thanks to UNC Greensboro. And, um, you know, I think we're moving forward. You know, right now, I think um, we kind of put ourselves in a position that if, if we, we could do a live one, it may, we may do it in the spring. We's all, we've also heard too, even though the author was gonna do it virtually, I think the author would like to come to Greensboro and be a part of the panel if we do it, uh, especially, you know, February or, Ma or March. So, you know, in a way, we, we're going to plan for that just in case. But we also realize, too, that there are limitations and there are facilities that will not have but so many people. So, um, you know, we have to, you know, and, and that can change very quickly. So we have to kind of be careful with that. And, you know, our planning just has to be different. But I, but I think we're doing fine. And um, definitely, um, this has been a wonderful opportunity. I have enjoyed it. Good. Beth, then, did you had anything else you wanted to add to that question or? Yeah, let's see. I did have a few more notes. Um, <clears throat> uh, what issues, you know, what did you do to mitigate them? Um, always trying to um, wrangle, um, you know, new groups that have, um, you know, something to do with, with local um, veterans to get involved. Um, especially if they have a UNCG connection. So, um, you know, the UNCG Veterans Center, um, Student Veterans Association, I make sure I can, you know, always invite them and see if they can bring it, you know, bring students. Uh, now the Alumni Association has, um, <clears throat> they've started an uh, alumni veterans group. So they sponsored a table two years ago. Um, so it's great to, you know, um, you know, get veterans to come in and, um, you know, Terry actually, who's a Coast Guard veteran, um, has been coming too. So it's just nice not to have, you know, just women veterans. Um, and I guess for mitigating them, um, what issues did you encounter this year because of COVID, um, doing the luncheon via Zoom did save money because we didn't have to feed anyone, but um, you know, trying to quickly, um, me learn the technology and getting help, um, figuring how to do this online. And then since the majority of the participants, the luncheon participants are, um, even older than me, um, you know, really trying to, um, <clears throat> you know, work with Sean and Melody to, you know, really try to take uh, it step by step, um, you know, give them like, here's a tutorial on how to do Zoom. And, you know, it, it was somewhat successful. And then a few women, um, you know, one uh, um, veteran um, donors who live out in Hendersonville, who um, don't have the internet, they don't have a voicemail. So you have to call them you know, I called them individually, like, hey, can, you know, please just call in. So we had some via the phone. Um, the upside of Zoom was that I could send it out to everyone. So, you know, if you were in, in Colorado or Taiwan or wherever, so we actually were able to get some participants virtually who would not ever be able to come 
I mean, I guess you could drive in or fly in from Colorado, but generally they don't. Um, you know, so, you know, participants from everywhere. And <clears throat> another thing that um, I thought worked quite well is to get two veterans who were big supporters um, financially and otherwise of the project to get them involved in the program itself. And um, part of it was le uh, essentially letters from SCUA, letters from the WVHP. So having the veterans themselves get involved and read some of the letters, um, I thought that was you know, so essentially getting the participants involved in the program itself, I thought that, that worked well. Um, doo -doo -doo, that's, that's my um, addendum, so. Good. Well, thank you. Um, right now, for everyone who is watching for the Q&A, feel free to turn your cameras and your um, microphones on if you're comfortable and if your environment is conducive for that. Because now we're going to open up and let um, you all ask questions to Richard, Gerald, and Beth Ann. Um, I already see one in the chat from Aaron, and so um, I'll kick off with that one. The question asked is, um, everyone has had to shift some aspect of their project because of COVID. Do you anticipate incorporating any of the remote work options into your project in the future whenever we return back to normal times? Why or why not? Um, so again, given the changes you've made because of COVID, would you keep any of those in your um, future programming when we return to whatever normal will look like? That's a that's a good question. Um, but DLAS, um, I won't get into it's how that's affect, how it's been impacted by COVID. But we we have had to make some shifts as far as things like public programming we do. Um, but I don't I think. You know, that was winding down. I, I don't think we would change it, keep anything we're doing now when we shifted back, except, you know, we've been talking about a year-end event that we're required to do. And um, I, you know, that that might actually turn into some sort of interesting Zoom week-long conference because there are other people doing work like this that work with us, um, Cornell, Mississippi, for example. And what if we could bring all these people together to doing this sort of work, talk about how you actually do this sort of project. It's an interesting idea. Now with Well Crafted, um, you know, a, a large part of that project is oral history interviews. We always would go to the brewery if possible, and we'd sit there with them and talk with them through the interviews, which of course you have that person to person conversation there, but you also are in their space, right? And there's something to be said for space and time and these sorts of things and we can't really do that anymore so we've been experimenting with doing some work in zoom with doing our oral history interviews like what does that really change and i personally have done two of them so far in zoom and it is different but you're still getting the information you're still talking to somebody and that's zoom might be one way that we could get beyond um, some of these restrictions that we talked about earlier because you know traveling to the coast to interview um, some important people in Wilmington, for example, costs money. But if you can work with them to to come up with a mutually agreed upon time to actually do an oral history interview over Zoom, you're at least making you know the foundation there, and you're at least doing getting the interview done, right? Um, although you know it might be a little more difficult to build that initial rapport with people. Uh, because you then you're doing all of that work remotely over email and Zoom, so you're not necessarily getting that one-on-one -on -one experience, but you're getting the job done, and it enables you to have a broader footprint without dramatically increasing your um, budget or like or thereof. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think that question might pertain more to to well crafted from my experience than DLAS, because um, a lot of DLAS is remote work anyway. It's people doing transcription work from a computer. When we first built the project, I was very adamant when we were writing up our grant that this was going to be very much a project that people could work on from their homes. Because in working with volunteers early on, um, they very much were like, it would be great if we could just sit on our couch and do this. So that project from the get-go was almost built for code in that weird kind of way, whereas well-crafted is a much more have-to-be-there-with-people sort of situation as it was initially um, conceived. 
Gotcha. Gerald, Beth Dan, would you like to answer that question? I was just a quick answer. I would say yes. Um, even though this is different, what we're doing more virtual, it's been good. And you know, our numbers have been okay too. Um, of course, if I if I was writing the proposal again, I probably would have done a little bit more with smaller groups if I knew it was going to be virtual. And I probably would we probably would have some maybe some different themes that we, you know, a, a little bit more. And and really I say we do that because we want to be able to get the grant. We want to be competitive. So definitely being the virtual, it gives us, you know, opens up some other options. Uh, that's a really, this is a really good question that I hadn't really considered. Um, and so I, I, at this time would say no. Um, and the reason is, I'm not really sure in terms of return of investment, if it's worth it. Um, the thing about the luncheon is it, you know, the the face-to-face -face experience, the, the esprit de corps, as it were, um, really is, is, I think, the big thing. Um, so we did it via Zoom this year. I recorded it. Um, I... It, it, so we had, a, I have, you know, Melody and, and, and Sean had to help out with that. A lot of tech, not a lot. There was a few technical glitches. Um, Shell Cross, I had to get involved because, you know, I wanted to put it on, you know, taking a Zoom video recording, I wanted to edit it so we didn't have to listen to me going, oh, uh, oh, this isn't working. This worked in practice because you know, and then beforehand where people were just getting on and like, how does this work? So I just wanted to edit it so it was the program. And that took um, a lot of time resources from Cheryl. So it's up there on you, uh, the school YouTube channel. I learned how to, you know, to do that. And, and it automatically does some transcription. Um, the thing is, uh, you know, and I sent it out to everyone on the mailing list, like, oh, this is great. This is what you missed. And, you know, I think the program was was you know pretty good for what it is and i just looked it up and we've had 48 views and i'm pretty sure most of them are me just checking in for a variety of does this link work or um so it's a lot of work and i you know i'm i i'm trying to think of how it worked you have to have a camera person will we live stream it it's just you know trying to get video in the alumni house. You know, I, I certainly can be convinced otherwise because every year turns out to be different. And I try not to be obstreperous in terms of, we, you know, we did it this way in year 2000, we're gonna continue to do it that way. But, um, you know, I'm not, not really sure what adding all that extra work would accomplish. So, but it's a great question. And again, I can be, um, you know, I'm open to being convinced otherwise. Okay, again, good question, Aaron. Is there another question? Feel free to turn on your camera or your mic or put it in the chat. I don't wanna leave anyone out. As we wait for a question or as people think of it, I wanna ask, are there particular resources either on or off campus that you've used to help build your community connection? Uh, I'll go first then. Um, yeah, uh, I, th I think it's, you know, I already mentioned campus communications. Um, Eden and Alyssa have been, and Jeff over there have all been really supportive of my work to the point where every once in a while they'll email me asking if there are some updates that they can talk publicly about, which there are not right now. Um, but they've been, you know, very receptive to ideas they've really um, you know been initiated conversations with me themselves um, about multiple of my projects so they've been really great um, ICEE -E, um, and Emily Yonke have been great they're, they're they really understand what we're trying to do especially with you know a project like well crafted they get it um, so I think a campus, especially in those two areas off the top of my head, have been have, have been great. 
Uh, in the broader community, you know, I'll also mention Terry Shell. Um, I'm a cheerleader for Terry. She's always been very supportive of our work. Um, and the broader community is just, honestly, the African American Historical and Geological Society has been great so far as um, working on my project. That you know, they they were understandably a, a tough nut to crack at first, um, and, but then you know, once 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 we got to know one another, it's just it's been a blossoming relationship and wonderful. Um, you know, outside of that, it, it really is you know you it's getting to know the people or the organizations that are related to your project, however you're defining project. So with Wellcrafted, the Tribe Brewers Alliance, we actually are on a grant with them now. They're great. I was coming on Craft Brewers Guild. It's been amazing. Um, so yeah, it's you know yeah. I could ramble, but I think that, that sums it up off the top of my head. Gerald? You know, be, because we've been away from campus, unless people read about it in columns or somewhere, they probably don't know, really know about our, the, the, this, this particular grant. But definitely there are folk in the library who've been very supportive and encouraging, and definitely African American African Diaspora Studies Department has been as well. And true, it, you know, when we first proposed this, we knew we were going to be over all over campus, and we've had to do something different. But um, but definitely, maybe we'll hear more as we do more things in the spring. Uh, I've addressed. I, I mean, I've kind of mentioned a couple times, um, you know, who I've worked with. But um, I guess my big thing would be on campus is, you know. For years, I was doing this by myself. I figured this is part of my job. And everyone knew that around September, I was just going to be a basket case. Um, and then I always got sick right after. So it, it's, again, part of not, you know, I'm not great at asking for help, but help was um, forced upon me. And uh, it's really amazing. So having, you know, other pe people in the library um, who are, more experienced, more comfortable with fundraising and, you know, kind of general organization, um, you know, has, has really helped. Yes. Thank you, Sean. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't know what to do without you just in general and even, you know, and uh, with the luncheon also, um, you know, and then just in the community, you know, it, it, it's at this point, the luncheon is kind of a, you know, it's gotten enough, there's, you know, it's sort of buzz, like it's a cool ticket. So, you know, um, you know, making sure I get uh, local veterans organizations, um, you know, some some different VA hospitals who are, you know, have staff that are invested in women veterans, you know, getting them involved. The American Association of University Women, um, Laura Tu is very into this, so, um, you know, she does publicity that way too. Uh, um, so yeah, it's a lot of just, um, you know, person by person, bird by bird, and uh, accepting help, perhaps, you know, still work on my graciousness, but I'm trying, um, you know, and, and just an example, like I'm not sucking up to our moderator, but Nikia was, was um, you know, you know, she had your experience and connections, you know, reaching out that would never have occurred to me, everything from, you know, book signings to, you know, getting local florists to, you know, um, do, you know, donate some of the flower centerpieces that just can go on and on. Um, Kathleen's really good at caterers and tablecloths, uh, <laughs> things like that. So I'm not the most visual person. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, let's see, nah, 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 nah. yeah, so that, that's, that is my answer. Gotcha. Does anyone else have a question? Y'all should feel good. Y'all have covered like everything. There's no questions. Um, if I can, I would try to sneak in. Yes, tablecloths are important, Kathleen. I would try to sneak in and we have a couple of more minutes. So 
Richard, you mentioned previously about making sure everyone at the table, so to speak, is speaking the same language. Has that been an issue um, with any of the panels here and doing your partnerships and trying to, um, as you have to change and modify your project, right? Because, you know, regardless what happens, things, things change or maybe visions change or how to get there. How has mitigating this difference in language and vision, um, has that come up and how have you um, worked through that? Does that make sense? Uh, I'm assuming I already answered the question. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't understand the question. Oh, all right. So like with your projects, right? And your community partners or people at the table, have y'all ever had a difference in the, the vision? The vision could change or how you get to an end goal. Like has that occurred and how have you worked through that? Uh, I'll just pop in if that's or unless Gerald since you have your last name begins with H. <laughs> you can go I, ahead. Okay. Well no I feel I'm gonna feel guilty the rest of the day. Please Gerald go ahead. You mentioned the vision changing. That hasn't happened on this project, but I've been on projects where that has happened. And um you know you try to do the best you can. I mean if you can make if you can modify but um, sometimes you just can't modify and you have to be very honest about it. But, um, but luckily I haven't had, we haven't had that problem on this one. But um, yeah, is that, I hope that answers it a little bit. It does for me. Uh, yeah, it definitely, yes. Um, as I uh, mentioned, this really started out as a celebration, like yay, women vet, you know, who served in the military because no one else was acknowledging them. And um, as I said, I wasn't here, but you know, what I heard was, you know, these women were just very excited because no one else, had, you know, acknowledged their the fact that they even served. Um, never mind, you know, giving them a special uh, event focusing on them. Um, so yeah, every year it changes and there has been in the last few years, we'll just say discussion on, uh, the purpose of the luncheon, you know, is this just fundraising, you know, um, there's going to be an issue, um, going forward right now, we're a little bit on, uh, easy street with having, um, the most of the cost financially sponsored, if that goes away, um, you know, the question is who can afford $25, $30 a ticket, um, you know, so right now anybody can come, which is, is, is great. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, just, just sort of making this event for people with money makes me very uncomfortable, but, um, you know, it, this, this, this luncheon, you know, we're not, I'm a, you know, part of an academic research archives and I just inherited this luncheon. So is it a fundraising? Is it promotion? I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of a weird bit. So it, it evolves and, you know, next year, the answer to that question might be different than in, again in two years. So. All right. Well, if there's not any other questions, Aaron, um, I'll gladly hand it back over to you. Um, if you see fit to wrap up and again, to remind people of the next one. Yeah, thank you to everybody for coming. Um, the recording for this one will be there soon. Um, but thank you to our three participants and our lovely moderator. Um, we will be back January 7th, I believe it is, on Thursday, same time. Um, once again, it'll be with ULVLC, so you will get information from Jenny Dale uh, about how to sign up and get the link. Um, and as always, um, if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to contact any of us directly. And I hope everyone, since I probably won't see virtually most of you um, in the next week or so, um, I hope you all have a nice um as nice as we can have these days holiday um break time so um thank you thank you thank you thank you all
thank you all so much. This is this is Jenny. Let me put my camera on. I just want to say thank you so much for um, bringing this to the ULVLC. Um, and we all look forward to the next edition on January 7th, 2021. That's right. That's right. Can you believe it? We That's made right. it. Almost. We made it. <laughs> all right, folks. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.